Доброе утро. Good morning. We will continue our discussion from last week. And this is a discussion of the Russian youth group. And we uh, have these discussions once a week after the service in, in the church library. But this is a videoed session. And so this discussion, the first discussion we had, talked about the theme of knowledge, faith, and reason, and the church's position of viewing that. That is the interplay between knowledge, faith, and reason, and how the church considers that. It's a vast theme. It's a vast theme, this interplay and, and these subjects matter, this subject. And so uh, we decided that the best way to approach the subject is by asking the right questions. And one example uh, par excellence would be Socrates. Uh, Socrates was a, a fourth century uh, Greek philosopher living in Athens. And what he did, all he did was to ask questions. He would wander uh, through the marketplace and ask questions. And Socrates was known as the wisest of all men. One of the answers he had to a question was the question, what is true knowledge? And Socrates answered, true knowledge is that I know that I know nothing. And that seems like a paradox. But um, I asked the class, the, the, the discussion group, the youth discussion group, what they think that that means. Of course, that involves a, a sense of humility to admit that you don't really know things, uh, but it, it might point to something deeper. And one of the uh, discussants, or the people who are discussing the participants, uh, Nikita Nazarenko, he said, uh, he said that true knowledge is understanding the human condition. And I think this is a very, it's an excellent answer that I, I couldn't phrase that well, but I, it inspired me um, to better understand what the human condition is. And that's what today's session uh, will be about. And we, of course, the, the sessions are held as a discussion group, so uh, this is a video of that, of my thoughts, but not, unfortunately not the students' thoughts. If you consider that, uh, it's very um, humane, and it, has, it shows a lot of empathy, I think, in, in Socrates, who was also considered a, a kind of an image, uh, an image of Christ, in, a proto-Christ a proto image. And that was discussed as well, very briefly. And, uh, but that's a question. So Socrates is a very unusual person who raised, who brought us to this topic today. What is the human condition? And so um, I, I want to add a, a further question to trying to understand the human condition. And um, what is it within this so-called human condition that could make us better people? What would make us more humane? So let's start. And um, we, we have to uh, first try to understand, what the, and it's a vast subject, the human condition. Be, again, uh, it's, it's something that's been uh, discussed by philosophers and uh, addressed by all the religions. But what exactly is it? And so we're going to approach this in three ways. We're going to look at various uh, quotes that I've selected, some of the quotes. We're going to look at the, the church, the, uh, the, our church position on the human condition from various quotes. And we're going to finally discuss this, which I'm, I'm not sure um, we'll have a, an opportunity to do this today. So let's, let's look at the first quote, and it's by William Shakespeare from As You Like It. And if I may read it, it says, All the world's a stage and the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, and his acts being seven ages. And he, he goes on to describe these seven ages, and that has to do of the ages of man from, from birth to death. And uh, so 
what could this portend? What, what does Shakespeare mean by this? And what do you, how do you interpret that? And I, I think a lot of people would say that uh, it, it shows that we're, um, it would show that we're actors, that our human condition is simply acting out different roles to which we're given by our stage in life. Uh, and that we have stages in life and it leads to uh, one final conclusion. Um, so that's, that's not a very optimistic view, but that's, uh, I think a lot of people would probably agree with Shakespeare. Um, uh, there's others like, let's say, Oscar Wilde, who would say that all the world's a stage, but the, the play is poorly acted. <laughs> um, or, or perhaps uh, another person, I forgot his name, but it was V for Vendetta, he would say all the world's the stage, but everything else is vaudeville. So this is what Shakespeare said, and I, I want you to consider what he said, and perhaps it's meaning for yourself. There is a, a philosophy of, let's say, a political philosopher, Hannah Arendt. She lived in the United States, and she said something very interesting, I thought. And she said, the human condition is such that pain and effort are not just sim symptoms which can be removed without changing life itself. They are the modes in which life itself, together with necessity to which it is bound, makes itself felt. Um, I, I'm not going to repeat that. Perhaps it would be easier to read that yourself. The easy life of the gods would be a lifeless life. And she um, published a book in the mid-20th century called The Human Condition, and it describes that very well from a political point of view, where, where labor is a very important part, and she distinguishes between labor and work. So, <clears throat> and then there's a writer called Catherine Center who said the human condition is imperfection, and that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, so, um, you, you might not agree with that, but that sort of reminds me that this, this, hum, this term, human condition, was, was I believe, coined uh, in the mid-20th century to mean something very specific and very existential uh, by, by the philosophers of the time who were existentialists. Um, another uh, philosopher, Albert Camus, as you, as you might know, he was a, a very, I think, a very interesting person and, and uh, he was, he was an atheist, but he, uh, he said a lot of interesting things. And what, one of these things that he said is that he who despairs of the human condition is a coward, but he who has hope for it is a fool. Um, well, you might not agree with him, but uh, that, that is part of our human condition, is to disagree and, and to agree. Um, then what did Socrates say? Now you have to remember that Socrates lived from the fourth century BC. So what did he say about the human condition? He says, remember, no human condition is ever permanent. Then you'll not be overjoyed in good fortune, nor too scornful in misfortune. And that sounds like very, very good advice, and it's something that you might find in the fortune cookie. Uh, and, but you, you have to ask, what is he really saying what, about the human condition? Do you think he has empathy for a, a kind of a transcendence from this human condition? But that's, that's what Socrates said, who also said that true knowledge is uh, that I understand the human condition, is our interpretation. So what is Socrates saying here? And what did he really say that true knowledge is that I know nothing? Um, let's, let's look to the church position. And this is from uh, Genesis, and you have to understand that's, that's in, a, in the Jewish tradition. And <clears throat> in Genesis, it says, by the sweat of your brow you shall eat bread. Um, that means you'll have to labor to, to make enough, to do enough, to be able to feed yourself. Till you return to the ground out of which you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Um, I'd say that's not a very cheerful um, <clears throat> view of the human condition, but you have to also remember that in the background, in, in the preceding this, this statement, um, God, God created man in his image. And this is after Adam's fall that um, 
God uh, placed it in what is called the human condition on earth. So that's the Genesis view, the Jewish tradition. And also, let's, let's look at um, what St. Paul, the Christian tradition, and let me read this again. Rejoice always in, in all circumstances. Give thanks to the Lord, for this is the will of God for you will for, for you in Jesus Christ. Rejoice. Um, and if you notice, uh, the Christian response to the human condition is one of joy, to rejoice. So it's very different from what we've seen in the other quotes and the other approaches. So it's rejoice. And what did Christ himself say? Christ said, uh, this is John. John said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. So uh, what John says is that we, in the human condition, have hope for the future. And that's not something that you find in the other teachings. Okay, so um, we reflected this, reflected on this in class, and um, I, I think these are interesting quotes. They're they're not the full compass, full range of, of all the thoughts that we could quotes that we can look at. But let, let's go on, and um, let's look at uh, some human aspects of the human condition. Um, and here we, we have the repentant Mary Magdalene. This is painted during the Renaissance. Uh, and she's, I think she's reflecting the human condition. And one of the first aspects would be imperfection and impermanence, that we, things change through time. And this is something that the Greeks, the Greek philosophers noticed. And uh, their answer to that a lot of their answers to that, many of their answers to that, would be that what is eternal is, is truth. But we live in an impermanent world and we're looking for an answer to this world ourselves. So one of the, another quality is courage and cowardice. And how do we approach this makes a difference. How we approach our human condition. Hope and despair. Uh, in the Christian tradition, it's the sin to despair. Perhaps you can think of some others. Passion. Yeah, uh, passion is a human condition that we're all bound to. And uh, Mary Magdalene is, is uh, it's a repentant Mary Magdalene in this, uh, in this painting. It took the artistic world that long to realize that she had sinned and that she's a repentant woman uh, because initially she was not uh, portrayed that way. She was just another woman uh, who followed Christ and loved Christ. But it, it, so that our cognition of these different figures changes with the social climate. Passion. Wisdom and foolishness. So we approach our condition through both of these um, aspects of our, of our selves, our human selves. Labor, as I, Hannah Arendt would have, we have to labor to uh, feed ourselves. That's an aspect of the human condition, which is not joyful. Death, again, is not very joyful. Pride and shame. And so we have these aspects of ourselves that we have to live through. Uh, and find an answer. Repentance and rebelliousness. Forgiveness and anger. Another aspect of our human condition. Reconciliation. So we uh, can not only uh, understand the condition we're in, but accept it. And that's, of course, that's different than forgiveness, but it's, it's very similar. Makayanya. Um, faith. That's, I think it's an aspect of our human condition is to have faith. And faith is not the same thing as belief, as you might know. It's, it's something, it's um, having trust in God. Love. It's something um, I think that's probably important as an answer to the human condition. 
Um, and finally, I think what we have is joy, that we have to uh, find joy in, in the life that we have. So these are aspects of the human condition. Um, and the question I'd like to ask um, is, how do the different philosophers and the different religions address the human condition? How would they address the, this human condition? I, I think this gives you a, a fair sense of what I'm trying to say about the human condition. Is this a vast subject, but uh, it's to grasp all that we are as we live. And so, uh, so this is a topic that philosophers and religions addressed. So, and it's a question, um, are they really addressing this human condition? So let's look at the first person that we've spoken about, that's Socrates. And I, I think, and I, perhaps you'll agree with me, is that he asked um, the question that I know nothing. The answer to the question, what is true knowledge, that I know nothing. I think he's addressing the human condition. But I think, uh, my opinion is that the Greek philosophers found that addressing the human condition, you would try to find wisdom in your life. And I think that's, that would be the answer. Uh, for Plato, it would be the meditation on the true form. I think Socrates was, sign, was saying that you find wisdom in your life. Uh, so so I, I, think, I think that's what he was saying. Perhaps you might not agree, but I, I think the, our, our discussion group agreed. Um, let's see what Buddha said. Now, Buddha, as you know, was a, uh, came from the Hindu um, background, and he, he broke with the Hindu tradition, and the Hindu religion. And they're both very similar. In, in looking for nirvana, but Buddha is very, very much more um, Protestant. He's a Protestant Hindu, you could say. And what he said, and I'll have to read this again, he said, humans create suffering through their greed, their anger, and ignorance. So it's through their human condition and not paying attention to the wrong aspects of their human condition that they create suffering. And he proposed an eightfold path as a way to extinguish the sufferings. Uh, and they are the right views, looking at the world correctly or yourself correctly, right resolve, aspirations, right speech, right action, conduct, right livelihood, the way you live your life, and right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And as you uh, may remember, uh, Buddha had a, a vision. He, he started fasting. He was fasting and meditating, and he was released from uh, this world to understand um, kind of the meaning of our life and what we should aspire to. And this is his simple answer uh, to, to reaching that kind of understanding. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not through love, I, I don't think, so much, as it is uh, through um, seeking, well, it's a mystical understanding of, of kind of purifying yourself so you can blend with the one. Um, and that's true in Greek thought as well, and it's true in Hindu thought, but the one in, in Buddhism is a, not a personal God, it might not even be it's what we would recognize as a God at all, but when you blend with the One, you, um, you, you disappear from this world of cause and effect. And Buddha, from his compassion to people, um, would not ever uh, reach that nirvana, the state of nirvana, so that he could come back and teach mankind the right, uh, this eightfold path. So, you know, you do have compassion, but the, the source of this method is not um, compassion, it's uh, trying to blend with the one, which is kind of uh, reaching beyond passion, beyond love. So it's, it's not um, what we would understand in, in the Christian tradition. Okay, but it's interesting and it's, uh, it's very uh, 
if you look at the actions of the Buddhists, their, their actions are based on compassion. So it's an interesting approach. Let's look at Karl Marx, and we're moving away uh, we're towards, uh, towards from, from believing God towards the, the, the 20th century and uh, atheism and how uh, someone who has, I think Karl Marx was very deeply humanistic and he approached, he, he approached this uh, question of this, this kind of suffering in, in, this, in the industrialization in England with a very uh, humane but very atheistic uh, scheme. And so what, what, he, what he said is that man creates himself. And it, it, it can remind you of Nietzsche as well. The cause of suffering is due to socioeconomic circumstances, which under capitalism, capitalism is the economic form of, of, of um, government, uh, lead to alienation and exploitation. And that's what he saw in uh, in uh, 19th century England. Over time, capitalism will fall. That's through history. Capitalism will fall, leading to communism uh, and a more equitable and happier world. And so he saw a kind of a salvation through this mystical um, process called history. I, I call it mystical. Um, uh, Karl Marx is said to have put Hegel back on his feet. And what Hegel said was that um, history moves through thesis and antithesis. And that's what um, purifies man, man's condition, to better understand God. But uh, Karl Marx put Hegel back on his feet. And so you can see the construction and you can see his answer uh, to the human condition. Finally, what did Christ say? And Christ said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. And um, I think that's a very uh, simple um, path to understand, but it's very difficult to follow. So. Um, consider these as answers or uh, a ways of addressing the human condition. And um, I, I think we, uh, in, in the class, we discussed this, but I, I, I'm going to leave um, <clears throat> the discussion to the class. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll stop here in, in addressing the human condition and trying to understand it. And the final question I had for the class is that you think in better understanding the human condition, would that help us better understand this subject that we're trying to follow this semester, and that's knowledge, faith, and reason, and the interplay between those three and the church's view on the importance of this? Thank you.